Oh, for a muse of plague that would inspire the brightest memes of our generation. The bard wrote King Lear under quarantine, goes the famous tweet. Make great works of art, in while we all crouch for unemployment. <coughs> my eyes are like to roll out of my head, yet it got me thinking about Shakespeare, of plague in his day and the virus in ours. So I read and read down the rabbit hole to London in the year 1600. But pardon, gentles all, these references to Covid, they are sure to age like cheese. Enough of these pretentious verses, now for a scene change, and, oh, there the hearse is. <laughs> it's kind of weird that we learn about Shakespeare in English class and that Shakespeare is considered literature. I know this might not exactly be a shocking revelation, but Shakespeare wrote plays. He was a dramatist, not an author. Shakespeare is not meant to be read. Shakespeare is meant to be performed. Sitting down to read Shakespeare is a little bit like sitting down to read the screenplay of Jaws. I mean, you know, it's a great script, but wouldn't you rather just watch the movie? That said, there's a key difference between theater in Shakespeare's day and theater or film or TV now. Modern visual entertainment is just that, predominantly visual. It emphasizes spectacle. Today, when we go to the movie theater, we say, I'm going to go see a movie. In conversation with your friends, you might incredulously ask, wait, you've never seen Breaking Bad? And if your roommate or your significant other or your mom walked in on you right now and asked what you were doing, you'd probably say something like, uh, uh, nothing, I'm just watching a video. Back in Shakespeare's day, you didn't go see a play. You heard a play. Theater was much less about visual spectacle as it was about digesting the poetry of the language. Hamlet has a line where he says, follow him, friends. We'll hear a play tomorrow. The chorus in Henry V implores the audience gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. The prologue of Romeo and Juliet tells the audience to attend the play with patient ears. But that's not to say that theater in Shakespeare's time was exclusively an auditory experience. The actors had props and costumes, and sometimes they could be quite elaborate. In fact, during an early performance of Shakespeare's Henry VIII, a shot from a prop cannon set fire to the Globe Theater, burning it to the ground. That disaster pretty much ended Shakespeare's career, and he retired soon after. But the language was the star of the show, unquestionably. Set design was basic and functional. Most of these theaters had open roofs, and plays were performed in the middle of the day, so they would get the best light. So if you have a scene that takes place on the battlements on a cold night, your actors are performing that in broad daylight. You need to inform the audience of the setting purely through performance and dialogue. If it's supposed to be cold in the scene, you need a line where somebody says, it is cold. Otherwise, your audience might not pick up on that. Neither may your actors, by the way. In the 16th and 17th century, rehearsals were a rarity. Paper was expensive, so actors were generally only provided with their own lines and cues. Stage directions were extremely minimal. They might say, enter the king with attendance, exit Oberon, or that phrase, which is still very popular with hack screenwriters today, they fight. Most of the stage directions were not so subtly hidden within the dialogue itself. In one of the opening scenes of Macbeth, Banquo asks, Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that sound so fair? This is a cue for the actor playing Macbeth to act frightened. Sometimes the dialogue also included cues for the audience. In the opening scene of Hamlet, Horatio and a group of guards up on the battlements see the ghost of Hamlet's father. And Marcellus, the captain, asks Horatio, Good now, sit down, and tell me, he that knows, why this same strict and observant watch so nightly toils the subject of the land. So all the characters sit down, and Horatio delivers some not-so-vital exposition about the late King Hamlet's wars against Poland and Norway. This is Shakespeare's way of telling the audience that now might be a good time to run outside for a piss, or flag down one of the vendors circulating around the theater to buy some beer or some snacks, or even strike up a private conversation. Yeah, back then, people talked during plays. They would heckle the actors, comment on the action. The theater wasn't a quiet and respectful place until the 19th century. So imagine your worst 
movie theater experience, you know, in a horror movie or something, with people going, oh, no, don't go in there. Hey, don't go in there. Oh, no. Just imagine that, but every single time you go to a play. Typically, the loudest and most boisterous audience members were what Shakespeare called the groundlings, the peasants who occupied the cheap seats on the lower level nearest to the stage. Now, I say cheap seats, but uh, actually that part of the theater was standing room only. Imagine what it would be like to perform for those people. I don't think that is poison! Ha <laughs> ha! His name is Bottom! Go back to Yorkshire, Dickie! Dickie! Oi! Make up your mind, you Danish cunt! Even if you did have a little bit of money and could afford a better seat in back or in the upper levels, then you still had to pay extra for a cushion. And the richer audience members were not much more respectful than the groundlings. If the play-within-a-play scene at the end of Midsummer Night's Dream is any indication, then the upper-class Elizabethan experience of theater going was a lot like watching a movie with your friends on your couch at home. In the scene, the main characters and the courtiers of Duke Theseus are watching this terrible play put on by Bottom's company, and they're just mocking it to the actors' faces the whole time. At the end, Bottom asks the Duke if he wants to hear the epilogue, and Theseus says, No epilogue, pray you, for your play needs no excuse. Like, just shut it off. I can't stand another minute of this. Many of us have this misconception that theater in Shakespeare's day was stuffy and pretentious, but nothing could be further from the truth. This was popular, mainstream entertainment. And the fact that the playhouses drew huge crowds six days a week in the middle of the working day testifies to that fact. One reason the theaters were so popular was because audiences were craving escapism. And considering the times in which they lived, you can hardly blame them. Shakespeare's London was not a safe, happy, or healthy place. The play has come. Remain within. Theatres are closed by order of the Privy Council. Public dancing rooms, gaming tables, and music houses are shut up. Mary Andrews, Jack Puddens, rope dancers, and such like doings are suppressed. Remain within. The plague is come. Theatres are closed by order of the Privy Council. Come here. Don't you know that the streets aren't safe with this plague? Come with me. My house isn't far. We can ride out the quarantine together. Oh, come now. I've got hand sanitizer and... Plenty of this. Yeah. The good shit. Come. Come. The bubonic plague first came to the south coast of England in the summer of 1348, part of the devastating pandemic we refer to now as the Black Death. By the end of the following year, upwards of half of Britain's population would be dead. But the disease was still very much alive. Over the next few centuries, no less than 40 plague pandemics would hit the city of London, the most famous being the Great Plague of 1665, which killed a quarter of the city's residents. Famously, the Great Fire of 1666 halted the plague spread in London, though outbreaks would be common well into the 18th century. In the 19th century, plague resurfaced again in China, and it can still be found in places like Peru, Madagascar, and the southwestern United States. Between 2010 and 2015, 500 people worldwide died of plague. Thankfully, these days, you can knock out the Black Death with some powerful antibiotics, not so in Shakespeare's time. In 1592, the plague returned to London and started killing people at an alarming rate. City officials promptly closed all large public venues, including the theater, but despite their best efforts, the plague would drag on for the better part of two years. The crisis eventually subsided, only for plague to return again in 1603 and yet again in 1606, with a devastating death toll and crippling blows to the economy. Imagine what that would be like. A devastating epidemic with a high death rate happening once every few years. Thomas Decker, one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, wrote a vivid account of the 1603 plague in his unfortunately titled pamphlet, The Wonderful Year. Here he sets a poetic scene, asking his readers to imagine what it would be like walking down the streets of the infected city. What an unmatchable tyrant were it for a man to be trapped every night in a vast, silent charnel house, home 
to make it more hideous, with lamps dimly and slowly burning in hollow and glimmering corners, where all the pavement should instead of grey and rushes be strawed with heaps of dead men's bones, the bare ribs of a father that begat him lying there, ere the chapless hollow skull of a mother that bore him, round about him a thousand corpses, some standing bald upright in their knotted winding sheds, others half mouldered in rotted coffins that should suddenly yawn wide open, filling his nostrils with noisome stench and his eyes with the sight of nothing but crawling worms. We can find a more journalistic primary source in the form of William Defoe's A Journal of the Plague Year. It describes the 1665 plague, so a full two generations after our period, but I don't think there's a better account of what it would have been like to live through the plague in 17th century London. The theatres, music houses, and taverns shut up their shops, finding in dead no trade, for the minds of the people were agitated with other things, and a kind of sadness and horror at these things sat upon the countenances e'en of the common people. Death was before their eyes, and everybody began to think of their graves, not of mirth and diversions. To Defoe's dismay, the panicked people of London started turning to folk magic, witchcraft, and snake oil for remedies. They ran to conjurers and witches, and all sorts of deceivers, to know what should become of them, who fed their fears, and kept them always alarmed and awake on purpose to delude them and pick their pockets. So they were as mad upon their running after quacks, and mountebanks, and every practice in old woman, for medicines and remedies stir themselves with such multitudes of pills, potions, and preservatives, as they were called, that they not only spent their money, but he poisoned themselves beforehand for fear of the poison of the infection, and prepared their bodies for the plague, instead of preserving them against it. In 1603, as soon as the death toll reached 80, the plague orders were put into effect. City policies meant to contain the disease and manage its economic fallout. A special tax was instituted for the relief of urban poor who could no longer work. Physicians were sent to every parish in the city. And recipes for affordable, easily obtainable medicines were published in order to combat quackery and misinformation. The plague orders were first instituted in 1518 and probably updated in 1592. According to Defoe, 1603 was the first plague where the orders demanded the shuttering of houses, basically mandatory quarantine. This seems to have been done on a house-by-house -house basis. If a member of your household showed plague symptoms, you were required by law to report it to the local health examiner within two hours, and that very night, your house would be put on quarantine. They would paint a red cross and write a prayer on your door to signify to your neighbors that your house was infected. Watchmen would be deployed to your street to make sure you didn't leave during the day or even at night without good reason. And if a member of your family died, then that burial would have to take place at night. Friends and non-immediate family were forbidden from attending the funeral. Plague spread fast in the cramped filth of early modern London, even with the quarantines. At the height of the 1603 plague, 100 Londoners died every single day. With every plague, theaters were closed, and actors went broke, if they even survived. But by some miracle, William Shakespeare not only survived, but managed to thrive in this environment. Through three major plagues, he carved out a hugely successful career and a nationwide reputation. He was born the obscure son of a municipal alderman. He died a wealthy landowner with his own coat of arms. How the fuck did he do it? Shakespeare's biographers are notorious for their tendency to come to groundless conclusions based on pure speculation. The meme that's going around right now in March of 2020 about King Lear being written in quarantine unfortunately has no basis in evidence. Most historians agree that King Lear was written in 1606. It probably premiered at the court of King James I, a great honor for a company of actors, as part of the Christmas festivities at Whitehall Palace that year. Since the plague was also raging in 1606, you put two and two together, and hey, King Lear was probably written during the plague. But there's really no way of proving that it came about as a direct result of Shakespeare being cooped up at home while he was practicing good social distancing. 
The 1606 plague, which started in early summer, didn't even reach Shakespeare's neighborhood of St. Olive's Parish until autumn. His landlady died on the 30th of October, and he moved from his house shortly afterward. That is literally all we know. Primary sources about Shakespeare's life are incredibly scant, made up of just a few bureaucratic and legal records, from which very little can be reliably gleaned. It's no wonder that Shakespeare scholars have spent centuries endlessly poring over his plays, looking for any little clue they could possibly latch onto that might give them an idea of his personality. In my opinion, that's a pointless exercise. A tale told by idiots, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to look at the broad strokes and take you backstage to examine the cutthroat behind-the-scenes politics of theater in Shakespeare's London. When the 1592 plague hit, Shakespeare's career was just starting to take off. You'd think that this outbreak would have stymied his career, set it back considerably. Instead, it seems, the opposite happened. So back then, plays were put on by various companies of competing theater troops, founded by wealthy patrons. The Queen's Men was founded by Queen Elizabeth I, the Admiral's Men by Admiral Charles Howard, the Duke of Nottingham, and Shakespeare's own Lord Chamberlain's Men by, well, a guy named Lord Chamberlain. Patrons are wonderful things, by the way, and everybody needs them. The troops would hire out actors and writers to put on productions for them, and often they would stay with that one troupe for their entire career. It was kind of like movie studios in the golden age of Hollywood, where, you know, certain talent would be contractually bound to one studio or another. Throughout most of the 1580s, the Queen's Men were unrivaled, by far the most prestigious and successful theatre company in London. But toward the end of that decade, they lost several key members, which seems to have hurt the quality of their work, and the 1592 plague sealed their fate. Admiral's Men were hit hard too, but they bounced back. And in 1594, the Lord Chamberlain's Men were founded. It would be these two companies that would dominate theatre in Shakespeare's heyday. So the plague swept aside the old guard and made way for the new and up-and-coming dramatists like Shakespeare were given a huge opportunity to make their names. Robert Greene, a playwright for the Queen's Men, is credited, though there is some doubt, with publishing a pamphlet where he criticized his contemporary dramatists. In the pamphlet, he describes Shakespeare as an upstart crow, beautified with feathers. Greene could very well have been salty about the decline of his career and the meteoritic rise of Shakespeare's. Feuds between playwrights could take on the quality of YouTube drama and spiral completely out of control. There's no more famous example of this than the so-called War of the Theaters, a bitter pissing contest between playwright Ben Jonson and his arch-rival, John Marston. In 1599, Marston revised his play Histriomastics to include a character named Chrysogenes, who was a poet and a satirist. This character was widely believed to have been based on Ben Jonson, personally. It's possible that Marston intended it as more of a complimentary homage, but uh, many audiences saw Chrysogenes as self-important and arrogant, and Jonson himself definitely took it as an insult. He retaliated with a play called Every Man Out of His Humor, where he has a clown ridicule Marston's pretentious and bloated dialogue. This back and forth went on for some time. Marston, later joined by his close friend, the aforementioned Thomas Decker, mocked Johnson's personal appearance in particular. They made fun of his scrawniness, his red hair, and his fashion choices, while Johnson blasted both of them for plagiarism, calling Decker a mere dresser of plays. Johnson and Marston eventually reconciled, but that sort of feud was fairly typical for that environment, where big egos clashed in petty battles over real or perceived reputational slights. Hey, it's show business, and while we should be careful about making direct comparisons between Elizabethan theater and Broadway or Hollywood today, I do want to mention and emphasize that Shakespeare was a mainstream commercial playwright. He has much more in common with J.J. Abrams than he does with David Lynch. It's often said that great artists steal, and Shakespeare was no exception. Many of his most famous works were reboots of earlier plays. A play called The Famous Victories of Henry V was seen on the London stage a full 10 to 20 years before Shakespeare's version. Similarly, two plays about the life of Richard III predate Shakespeare's. You have the Thomas Legge play Ricardus Tertius in 1579, and the anonymous play The True Tragedy of Richard III, from about 1590. A production of Hamlet, referred to by scholars as Ur-Hamlet, was put on in 1587, author unknown. 
and many of that play's famous scenes, including the ghost urging revenge and the play being the thing wherein the prince catches the conscience of the king, were lifted more or less directly out of Thomas Kidd's hugely popular play, The Spanish Tragedy. Shakespeare was a poet, yes, but he was also a businessman who understood how to get butts in seats. In the film industry today, they would say that Shakespeare was writing scripts based on established properties. Pre-existing franchises with fan bases like Star Wars, Marvel, Ghostbusters, or Batman. That's not to say that Shakespeare was a talentless, money-rubbing hack. I mean, obviously this guy was a genius, and he took his craft very, very seriously. Hamlet's Speak the Speech monologue, where he takes a company of actors to task over their sort of undisciplined performances, might give us a general idea of some very real frustrations that Shakespeare might have had with actors. In the monologue, Hamlet urges the actors not to overplay it or underplay it, says that there's a happy medium. He says, do not saw the air with your hand thus, or sort of gesticulate madly, but acquire and beget a temperance that may give the performance smoothness. He also criticizes comedic actors for improvising during scenes to get a cheap laugh. He says, though this may make the groundlings laugh, you know, you fart on stage, people will think it's funny. He says that it can uh, only make the judicious grieve. Nobody's gonna be impressed by your farts. He says that actors should suit the action to the word and the word to the action. And reiterates that the purpose of acting is to hold, as twere, a mirror up to nature. To imitate humanity. It's amazing advice, and actors learn from it to this day. So here we have a man who is immensely talented, but who also has a knack for putting out marketable work. Such a star rose quickly in Elizabethan theater. After just a few short years with Lord Chamberlain's men, Shakespeare's plays made up the bulk of that company's repertoire. By the mid-1590s, at least two of Shakespeare's plays were performed for Queen Elizabeth, and when she died in 1603, Lord Chamberlain's men were renamed the King's Men, and given the personal patronage and favor of King James I himself. Shakespeare was obsequious and deferential to his royal and noble patrons, and while he might have not been the most egalitarian playwright of his age, his appeal transcended class divisions. The groundlings might not have gotten every reference to the classics or to mythology, but they sure as hell understood the dick jokes. There were stark differences between the haves and have-nots in Shakespeare's London, but they may have had one thing in common, the way they spoke. When the Normans first conquered England in 1066, the nobility of that country spoke French. But thanks to the calamities of the Hundred Years' War and the Black Death in the 14th century, English upper classes had a newfound sense of nationalism. They began to think of themselves as distinct and separate from the Francophone world, and by the reign of Richard II, English was the language of the royal court. The art of storytelling was also changing. Troubadours who sang of courtly love and heroic deeds in previous centuries were quickly becoming passé, and in their place a type of performative literature had developed, embodied by authors like Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer was of course very famous for being one of the first English writers to write in English, a trend that was probably encouraged by his patron, King Richard. But for 350 years, English had been a common, vulgar language. It had seen a transition from Old English, the guttural Germanic dialect of the Anglo-Saxons, to Middle English, which to modern ears is kind of decipherable. It sounds kind of like a hammered Welshman. At first, the nobility spoke a kind of French-English pigeon tongue, which itself had a huge influence on the language. But by the time modern English developed around the turn of the 16th century, the English that was spoken by rich and poor alike had a distinctly low-class sound. We can say this with a reasonable degree of certainty because of the hard work of one man, linguist David Crystal, who reconstructed the accent of early 17th century London by deciphering hidden meanings and rhymes in period texts, including Shakespeare. The accent, which is about 90% accurate, is called original pronunciation. Alas, poor Yarek. I knew him, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest, a most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, and now how a bard in me imagination it is. My gorge rims at it. Here, on those lips that I have kissed I know not how oft. 
where be your jibes now? Your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a rar. Not one now to mock your own grinning. <laughs> Quite chap -wallin. Now, get you to me lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favour she must come. Make her laugh at that. Well, that's different. Or very familiar, if you know the Witchfinder General. It sounds kind of like West Country English, or Hagrid's accent, what with the oi, 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 nu imereasio. You can also hear a bit of Pirates of the Caribbean in there too, can't you? You know, what with the hard R's, your gambles, your songs. You can hear all sorts of hints of modern day English language accents in it, including, I bet, your own. Of course, we're used to hearing Shakespeare in received pronunciation, the Queen's English, a very posh English accent. But it's important to remember that Shakespeare was a full 150 years away from the great vowel shift when the upper class in England in the 18th century started dropping their R's. So mother became mother, father became father. And for the first time since the 14th century, the upper class of England started linguistically separating themselves from commoners. Slowly, the great vowel shift trickled down to the lower classes and made its way around the world to all the colonies of the British Empire. The Boston accent developed, the Jamaican accent, the accent of the planter gentry in the antebellum south, all dropping their R's to imitate the trendsetters back in London. And in America today, accents have taken another 180 degree turn. In the 21st century, in this country, if you have a rhotic accent like mine, if you hit your R's, it's a sign of education and money. Whereas dropping your R's is a trademark of poor people. And by learning OP, you can uncover hidden meanings in Shakespeare that you didn't even know were there. No one demonstrates this better than the son of the linguist David Crystal, a guy named Ben Crystal, who was himself an accomplished Shakespearean actor in his own right. There's a great pun in As You Like It. In As You Like It, which is essentially a good duke, bad duke, good duke banished, runs off to a forest with his merry men. One of them isn't so merry, the melancholy Jakes. The melancholy Jakes comes back from having seen a clown in a forest and he's laughing and the Duke says, Jakes, why are you laughing? And Jake says, a fool, a fool, I met a fool this forest. As I do live by food, I met a fool who laid him down and basked him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms, and yet a motley fool. Good morrow, fool, quoth I. No, sir, quoth he, call me not fool till Levin has sent me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his poke, and looking on it with lackluster rice, says very wisely, it is ten o'clock. Thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it was nine, and after one hour more, twill be eleven. And so from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. When I did hear the motley fool thus moral on the time, my lungs began to crow like Chanticleer, that fools should be so deep contemplative, and I did laugh, sons intermission, an hour by his dial. <laughs> it's not funny. We looked at it in OP. In original pronunciation, the word hour is pronounced or, or, say it with me, or. Yeah, it feels good, doesn't it? In original pronunciation, the word prostitute, whore, is pronounced or. Hour, or, whore, or. A full, a full, I met a full in forest. As I do live by foot, I met a fool who laid him down and bashed him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms, and yet a motley fool. Good morrow, fool, quoth I, no sir, quoth he, call me that fool till Evan hath sent me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his pork, and looking on it with lackluster rice, says very wisely, It is ten o'clock. Thus you may say, quoth her, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it were nine. And after own or more, twill be a len. And so from or to or we ripe and ripe. And then from or to or we rot and rot. <laughs> and thereby hangs a tail. <laughs> it's a really rude sex joke. 
Shakespeare's full of them. There you have it. Original pronunciation. It's fascinating stuff. Someone should really make a historical film, spoken entirely in OP. And if that same someone had a crowdfunding campaign going on in March 2020, I'd definitely throw him a few bucks. Links down below. When I hear OP, it's like Shakespeare himself is reaching forward through time, grabbing me by the collar and slapping me across the face. It gives these plays so much more depth, nuance, and meaning. And of course, it really calls attention to that great foundation of theater in Shakespeare's London. The language. A gloom and end this video to it brings, for plague still ravages the countryside. Stay old, and dwell not on talk of sad things. Some of these shall like, and some shall subscribe, for never was an Easter Ray more queer than that of London in the time of Shakespeare. Fuck you! Yeah!